Uh, welcome to the studios of the Government Information Service, GIS, and the National Television Network, NTN, uh, at Tugane in Cass Street, St. Lucia, as you will see from our wonderful backdrop. And um, it's our second interview uh, in as many years with Dr. Jean Leon, the, the president of the Caribbean Development Bank. And today's conversation will be uh, based on his presentation, the presentation of uh, the president uh, to the 53rd annual general meeting of the Caribbean Bank, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank and its directors uh, here in St. Lucia. And um, that meeting started uh, on the 20th of June, and it was um, part of a series of events uh, evolving and revolving around uh, the 53rd AGM. And welcome again, uh, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Sir. And um, your presentation, the, the second that I had heard, um, like the first, was uh, heavier on facts than figures, and therefore, um, in my view, uh, much more understandable by being much easier to follow by those who, um, like me, are not that good at figures, um, but more <coughs> at facts. And um, the address put the Caribbean in the current context in 2023, um, a year after the war in Ukraine, um, several years after the COVID pandemic at a time when climate change is changing uh, worse, uh, the effects are also worse, and uh, the entire international um, movement does not flow in our direction, and um, your address asked for a new paradigm, a new thinking, a new set of approaches um, to all of the issues we mentioned, but you put it within the context of a new development paradigm, and you actually identified a tripod, three sets of um, definite proposals. So perhaps we could talk about, um, start off our, our conversation yeah. from that standpoint. Point. The, why you think we need a new paradigm starting with a new definition of development? Uh, th thank you, Earl. Um, maybe it's good to think about this as where we are today is at the same time a snapshot of where we were yesterday and equally an opportunity of where we need to be in the future. And so that confluence for me is always the appropriate way to start thinking about things. Because as you say, today we have essentially three things of yesterday that is uh, combining to tell us where we are now. I would say we had the structural legacy issues of all of our development um, problems and challenges before COVID. Then you had COVID that layered on top of that and added more. And then you had the Ukraine uh, tension war that was layered on top of that. And so we are at the point where today, not only did we inherit, but we have added to our challenges and the reaction of the world, not just our governments, the reaction of the world to the worsening, the layering I talked about, the worsening of our situation is not necessarily what it was at the time when each of those events occurred before COVID, immediately after COVID, for that matter, during COVID, post-Ukraine war. And so when we think of where we are today, and the world talking about a geo or, if you want, poly crisis with all of those layers, the reaction of governments is different because they themselves 
are equally in that very poly crisis that we talk about. And so our lens, since I spoke to you, in essence, has changed. What has not changed is the challenge of tomorrow, where we need to be. And where we need to be is clearly a function of what we can do today based upon where we are today and the means at our disposal to get us to where we want to be tomorrow. But as I said, the landscape has changed, both in intensity and in reaction. Today, where it was a few years back, and so the challenges we face are even greater than where we were when we last spoke. And so when I say we need a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, the question really is, are the tools that are being discussed now, the tools that we believe we have, are they adequate, fit for purpose enough to get us to that point that we talk about? And so we start from that as the first position to say, we need a change in paradigm. The paradigm for me boils down to one simple idea, which I talked about in my speech at the Board of Governors. And that paradigm is what exactly is development? And so while I think most people um, informed academics, policymakers, international institutions have agreed that development is very wide. They have sought to measure development by a proxy. And that proxy in general is GDP, uh, a gross domestic product or gross national income of a country. And so all of our measures, all of our policies are definitely focused on how do you increase GDP. And it's a standard narrative of all governments. Every year they take great pride in saying, by how much did they grow? But because you have linked GDP with development, and your focus is on GDP, then you keep making not only the mistake of saying you are developing because you are growing, but it also means you are equally making a mistake that the policies that you are driving or using to drive GDP clearly cannot be the appropriate policies for development. And so when I talk of this um, change in paradigm, it is to recognize that we need to, uh, what I say in regular nice terms, measure better so that we can target better. How do we measure better? We need to now see how better to measure development. So if we have a better way of measuring development, then we can target that development better through the appropriate sets of policies. And so the tripod that we talk about at the bank that captures that process is one which says, what exactly is the challenge that you're trying to establish? So that gives you the definition, a measurable definition of development. Translate that into one, objectives that can be measured at certain points in time to indicate how you are advancing in that development space. And if you have those objectives, then you end up with three things. One, what investments you need to undertake to be able to make them fit for purpose for the objectives you're trying to attain to get you to your development objectives. The second is how much do you need? What financing arrangements do you need that are not only adequate, but at the same time affordable, that will allow you to make those investments such that you can get to the objectives of question. And the third is even if you have the money and you know the investment, can you execute? 
and that tackles the issue of capacity, implementation capacity. And so it's when you bundle those three things together, then you end up with the ability to be able to get you to that point of development outcome that you'll be looking to measure. So that's the framework which we have distilled further to say everything we do, everything we do that meets that triangle to get you to those development outcomes, in principle requires one of three things, and that's the tripod that you refer to. Mm -hmm. The first is you need that paradigm shift, a different way of thinking, conceptualizing what development means and how you get there. The second is the policies. You need to have now a certain wider set of policies that tackle more than GDP, but tackle all of the measures of development that you are talking about. And the third is because it is so big and there's so much to happen, you cannot do it on your own. So you need to anchor this on partnerships. And the partnership side that we were pushing in a very big way at the annual meeting, we can capture by the phrase, sharing to grow. Because that's the only way. I think our mindset, our mindset is one where we can grow by hoarding, as it were, hoarding what we have. The moment you begin to hoard what you have, you restrict and constrain how much you can grow. Whereas if you are willing and open to share, as you engage in this process of growth, you will find that sharing allows everyone around you to grow, and it will redound to your benefit, and your growth potential will be so much more. And that happens at every stage in the process. So we capture that triology by the first part, measure better, to target better. That's your paradigm shift. Having adequate and affordable finance, which was the theme mm -hmm. of the thesis in terms of having now the policies in the financial space, in the broader economic development space, and then the partnerships through the sharing to grow concepts that will in principle then give you your best fighting chance of moving from where we are today to where we need to be in the future. But we don't have a point I have made um, many times, and I'll repeat, we do not have the luxury of time. And that is why we need to recognize the urgency. Because in the two years, two years that we, since we met, so much has changed, Earl, that even what we were contemplating then and what we need to contemplate now has changed. But you cannot say you need to wait for another two, three, five years to begin the process. You have to start now. The key is to anchor that process on a framework that itself is not changing, but allows you to be nimble, to adapt, to embrace change, keeping your eye on the prize. And keeping your eye on the prize is knowing what development means to you. That is your North Star we should not be allowed to lose sight of. Knowing what your development, Knowing what your means, development to you. means to you. And it is not GDP growth. Mm -hmm. Because development is wider, it's a larger slice, an integrated slice that puts people first and foremost at the center. And it, it, it is certainly um, something that I contemplated while uh, covering your speech, following it, and taking my notes. Um, you were, in my case, uh, preaching to the converted. Um, I have long held um, a similar view um, on GDP by virtue of other countries um, having raised it um, mainly at discussion level yeah. and not at the uh, macro level. Mm -hmm. But we also have a, a, a reality where, for example, you have um, indicated that the 
message to Bahrain member countries is that we need to act now and uh, together. Uh, but we're also dealing with the CDB is an institution. Mm -hmm. Your uh, governors represent mainly governments. Mm -hmm. Governments and institutions tend not to think the same way. Um, and what I heard you saying was let's go back to school on the whole issue of GDP. Uh, let's um, go back to the drawing board in terms of defining uh, development. Uh, but you made another key point. We have to uh, share to grow through partnerships, but we don't have the luxury of time. Um, do you think we have the luxury of time that will be required given the urgency of now uh, to um, re-examine the issues that you have identified. That, that's, my, that's, that's what bothers me. Yeah. The but urgency of now and the availability of time. But re-examining re -examining does not mean let us review and review and review no, but you actually agree. But you're actually saying let's change our yardsticks. We are saying let's change our yardsticks today. Mm -hmm. And I think we are at a point in time where we agree at least on the direction of change of that yardstick. Mm -hmm. And given the urgency of now, I think we have no other choice but to start the process. And I think I can say categorically that um, at the Board of Governors meeting, there was um, full support uh, by governors to allow CDB to continue that directional change of using and adopting a different yardstick. Now, the yardstick that we, we are looking at is not to get rid of GDP. Let's be, let's be very clear on that. Um, we are not saying jettison, get rid of, forget GDP. What we are saying is GDP is not adequate for at least our purposes. I believe for every country, but at least for our purposes. Mm -hmm. And why? Because a GDP as a measure, as it is developed and has been developed over the last, uh, say, 50 or so years, 60 years, focuses on the economic value under the system of national accounts, the economic value that is produced in a country. Now, that is defined typically in terms of what is called your production boundary. And as we very well know, production boundary does not involve even, for that matter, certain elements that are not included, like your informal activities. Mm -hmm. It does not measure certain things that do not count in economic production. For example, the state of a country in terms of your social development mm -hmm. doesn't measure yet things like the impact of climate change and what does it mean. Uh, doesn't measure yet the state of your institutional capacity. And so if all of those things are important for development, then the point we are making is focusing on GDP on its own does not come close to measuring the North Star of development that we need because all of those need to be included in, in development. So we have advanced this by saying, our countries clearly have two issues that are pertinent to our development in the future that need to be incorporated. The first is vulnerabilities. Now, our vulnerabilities broadly are of two types. You have vulnerabilities to natural hazards, whether they be the, the hurricanes, the St. Vincent type, um, volcanoes, uh, even things like drought that may impact us. You've had the pandemic, for example. Um, these are, as it were, natural hazards that impact us, and so we are vulnerable. That vulnerability, uh, Earl, is 
a degree of, let's say, susceptibility. It is something that can happen, something we are prone to observing. And so we can attach some degree of probability to it and say, based upon the past, there is a likelihood, a chance of being impacted by that. And so we can measure it and say vulnerability today is high, especially at this time of the year. All of us are in the hurricane belt. But that is only one slice of the story, and we need to add it because the fact that it's a likelihood means that the ability, and we know that to be for sure, the ability of countries to grow their GDP when you are in a vulnerable state at least means you will have the potential of volatility mm -hmm. up, down, mm -hmm. because we know it. Mm -hmm. Today you go forward, hurricane hits, next day you fall back. 40%. Exactly. <laughs> so we say you need to add vulnerability on top of GDP, but we make an additional point that depending on the type of shock, and I've only talked of natural, there's also the economic shocks, mm -hmm. like your war on Ukraine or your global financial crisis mm -hmm. or something happening in the U.S. economy that causes us supply to chain supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. When those happen, they equally disrupt our ability to manage that GDP that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. So depending on the type of shock, when it occurs, what matters, in our opinion, is not so much the vulnerability of yesterday. Because what was a probability yesterday becomes a reality when it occurs. Mm -hmm. The storm hits you or doesn't hit you. It crashes and damages everything in its path or partly. Or the impact of the COVID decimates activity. So it's an event. But that event has impact. And the impact, which will vary in intensity, depending on the type of shock and the severity of the shock, will determine how long it takes you to recover. And so this principle of recovery after a shock is captured in what we call resilience measures. You can only be resilient if you have an ability to recover, get up after you've been struck down, in a way that allows you to continue to advance to the end goal. Remember, that's where we are, that's our North Star, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? So the only way you can get to an end goal is if you have resilience. Because that is what allows you to build back and go beyond. And so in our mind, that resilience is different from the probability, the susceptibility associated with the different ones we are talking about. And so we want to add that as an additional layer on top of vulnerability, mm -hmm. on top of GDP. And so when you add those three, like three building blocks from GNI or GDP, mm -hmm plus resilience, mm -hmm. plus, sorry, plus vulnerability, plus resilience, we end up with the potential of making a mapping that to get to the North Star, to get to the North Star of development outcomes, we need a broader measure that includes all three things. And by extension, the new paradigm that we talk about means I need policies that grow GDP, policies that reduce vulnerability, mm -hmm. and policies that enhance, increase resilience, so that combined and integrated, I can get to my North Star of development outcomes. That is the eventual paradigm that we are talking about. So it is inadequate, but not to be gotten rid of. We need to augment it, and we have the framework to augment it, but we can start now, and we can start now not necessarily at its highest point of perfection, 
but with adequate increments to be better than the GDP or GNI on its own so that we can have a better chance of getting to the North Star. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of when I say uh, the urgency of now yeah. means we need to start. start. But mm -hmm. it is not constrained by the fact that you do not do have the agreement of, on everything. On everything, yes. yes. As long as, as long as each of the blocks in vulnerability mm -hmm. and resilience add over the GNI so that you are advancing up that step, then your chances of getting to your North Star are definitely going to be better and with a greater chance of getting to where you need to be, which is development. I think um, I would be correct to say that quite a lot of that came across in the appealing aspect mm -hmm. of your address where you have to ask your directors, let us agree. Yes. Um, also, you have uh, the, I think it, uh, you put it across in my mind um, very well on the climate change issue. And let me quote some of, of, no. of what you said. Um, you said that in the past year, the bank committed more towards climate change initiatives, mainly in energy and infrastructure, and has now adopted a climate finance target of 25 to 30% of its own resources yeah. uh, towards climate change adaptation and mitigation by 2020. Yeah. which is up from 11%, up 11% um, over 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, that is impressive yeah. and inspiring, but in the absence of the delivery pledges that have been made by the North, mm -hmm. um, particularly the G7 entities, the, 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 the countries that um, have been largely responsible for the acceleration of climate change, um, invariably you will have attended in your um, long careers many conferences where pledges are made yeah. and um, a year or two or a decade later we're still um, waiting for delivery. Yeah. On the issue of climate change, our resilience and our ability to survive and to um, act and grow and uh, share together uh, largely on the climate change issue depends on our, our ability to convince donors to deliver yeah. on the on the um on the outstanding yeah. debts, for example, I think the phrase we have, have used, there's a, a particular phrase we have um, used insofar as calculating the the environmental damage. Um, loss and damage. Loss and damage, yes. Yeah. climate justice. Yes, um, yes, et cetera. Yeah. Again, we are talking here about the need to move with time. Yeah. Um, GDP replaced a previous yeah. yardstick. Mm -hmm. um, we are at a stage where you have asked for agreement on the things that have changed between GDP and delivery on, on climate change promises. Yeah. Um, where does that leave us as a region yeah. um, insofar as other borrowing or borrowing member countries adopting the same approach as the CDB of increasing your national commitment mm -hmm. to um, the various funds that would be required yeah. in that new definition of development. So, so Earl, you have to bear with me a little because you've asked a lot <laughs> well, in, that, in that space, but maybe let, let, I want to make um, three points. Mm -hmm. The first point is that something we've been making all along is that development, development should never be viewed as a slice. In fact, the whole idea of the paradigm shift that I talked about, where I said GDP was inadequate. Is in itself a manifestation of looking at development as a slice. Mm -hmm. Because you are focused on 
GDP as a good proxy, or as we know it is not adequate. Mm -hmm. So we should be looking at development as a totality, a holistic paradigm, an ecosystem that says to be developing or to attain development, you need not only the economic, you need the social, you need the environmental, you need the institutional, and you need those to be able to integrate in a way that preserves the definition of the system of development. I think you put it best when you said where no part is left no behind. No part is left behind. And we exactly. are all some, exactly. of, the, uh, some exactly. of different parts. So, so that first point, that first point, and I want to link that mm -hmm. to the concept of urgency. Mm -hmm. That first point says, because we need to address everything, not necessarily all at the same time, but because we need to address everything, it is incumbent on all of our countries to do, in my mind, two things. Start today doing what you have the capacity and the ability to do, right? Second thing, start today or maybe the better word is continue mm -hmm. going forward to ask those that have the means to help, to help as much as possible to get you to do what you need to do. Now, the statement you made about countries not providing or making pledges presupposes that the first part of my start today to do what you can do and have the ability to do can only occur after those pledges are met. Mm -hmm. The pledges in my mind are in the ask and continue to ask where there is assistance to be had from others. Mm -hmm. But that should not prevent you from putting in every effort, every effort to doing what you have the means to do today. Okay, there's a, a big distinction here. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to call under the urgency of now, under the let's do now, the idea that we can all do something. We can all do something. But second, we can do it better, more effectively, to greater impact if we work together. We can do better together. We can do better together, okay? Mm -hmm. So there is always that room for us to do now what we have the means to do and do it better if we can work together as a region, first and foremost, but continue to pile as much pressure as we can on those that have the ability to assist, to assist us to get even further than what we can do on our own. That's the, the second part I want to, to make. And the third is when we say we want to increase our climate um, finance uh, footprint, it is not that we should see it strictly as pure climate. Now, there are all ways of measuring how much finance is going specifically to climate. But recall that climate is not, again, a slice. Climate is linked. When a hurricane hits you, it doesn't only hit your economy. It destroys livelihoods. It causes displacement of communities. It causes, in some instances, mental trauma. It causes health hazards down the road. It causes even potentially education stoppages, like we had in COVID. Not that COVID was a hurricane, but the point is that all of those are linked and linked together in this bigger construct of development. In fact, the, the way I, I, I like to explain it yeah. is, is that um, 
small island states like ours, mm -hmm. um, the majority of your Bora member countries, mm -hmm. um, we grew up knowing two seasons, yep. rain and sun. Right. Um, decades later, mm -hmm. we have what we used to be called um, tidal waves and our tsunamis, mm -hmm. and we have to cater for elements of environment, mm -hmm. climate change, and yep. all of that, whereas before we just had hurricanes, rain, yes. rain yep. and yep. sun. So within the context yep. of that mm -hmm. um, evolution yep. in our, our, our uh, hurricane mm -hmm. season, yep. uh, having many different parts and not just rain and floods mm -hmm. because today we have to also look at the other aspects which we never looked at like drought and yep. Um, yep. Um, um, explosions and so on. So uh, I thought I'd th throw that in sure. from the standpoint of people being able to to relate to these are experiences yep. we've gone through. Agreed. And um, equally to add to the point you've made, as you start to measure climate change, mm -hmm. it is eventually the accumulation. It is not the one-off event. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that you've had multiple, multiple hurricanes or impact of drought that has changed or the slow concept of, let's say, higher temperatures that have not only changed agricultural productivity, mm -hmm and uh, sea level rises, increasing water temperatures, changing even the viability of your fishing supplies. All of those things in the name of climate have been added on and accumulated over time. So when we say climate finance, mm -hmm. it is not just climate finance. It embodies mitigation, it embodies the adaptation, it embodies the loss and damage impacts that we are talking about, it embodies prevention, disaster management, both before and when an event occurs. And so talking of the increasing effort of own funds, even that may be a little on the conservative side. Mm -hmm. When you measure, when you measure all of the impacts we are looking at in the climate space. And so what we like to do, in fact, is to point out that the focus of the bank, and I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, has been to focus more on integrated development projects, whereby a project that may not sound like climate has a climate component. And so we might strip some of that out and add it for purposes of measurement and say this is related to climate finance. But um, it's a bigger issue than that. So, and I'll give you the example of one of our largest projects now, the St. Vincent Port Rehab. They're building a new port in St. Vincent uh, with the main goal of, uh, let's say, uh, improving overall efficiency of cargo and movements of um, goods and, and so on across uh, St. Vincent with its um, trading neighbors. But that was not just a port project. It included a certain degree of um, renewable energy usage built into that particular not just project. Building a new wharf. You're not just building a new wharf. <laughs> Includes climate mm -hmm. resilience so that you now see what happens in the impact of future changes in climate entering that space. But equally, there were social livelihoods that were impacted because of now that poor bringing in of the new port. How do you now relocate those people, make their lives better, is all included in that project. So on the one hand, we are looking at renewable energy, climate resilience, social resilience, and economic resilience, all built into one single project. So that, that's sort of like one one example that we can we can talk and about. And solutions will relate to that because this podcast trees, um, when it was developed in the post-1970 period, it uh, moved from being a, a wooden wharf mm -hmm. um, with north wharf and south wharf, one for cargo and yep. one for bananas. Yep. But as um, importing and exporting grew and world trade um, 
took a bigger role as we became independent, mm -hmm. um, the expansion of the port mm -hmm. replaced communities like right. Conway, mm -hmm. Fuasho, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. um, those communities had to be relocated, right. but in the absence of planning, right. um, the communities were relocated just like they were right. uh, to uh, other areas. Yes, so you have correct. moved um, yeah. one community of problems yeah. to another yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying yeah. in terms of yeah. St. Vincent mm -hmm. is that it would take all of these experiences into, into consideration. Account. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I use that to say that the focus on integrated project design mm -hmm. is a very important element of that very paradigm shift that we are talking about, that it is not just only treating projects as a narrow slice, but you look to widen the scope to capture as many elements of that development paradigm as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, another area, for example, is uh, just looking at uh, one of the uh, things that are big to us, food security. Mm -hmm. As you know, in the region, we are focused on looking at that. But should it be just production? And the answer to that has to be a categorical no. Because having planted, and as long as you have the land and you can plant, there has to be what is the educational element in terms of your research that can now help that process going forward in terms of being able to design certain uh, varieties of grains or seeds that can withstand the new higher climates, temperatures we will have tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Else mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. if we are struck, if we are struck in yesterday's agricultural mode without bringing in that climate change impact, we will find in another 10, 20 years, we will be struck. Mm -hmm. Equally, you can I make the point, storage. How do we store the foods? If we don't have the means to maintain appropriate temperatures, we may be looking at, again, spoilage of significant quantities. Is there room to have an embody clean energy, whether it is solar or in the case of a Guyana, maybe more gas, uh, so that it's clean, doesn't damage the atmosphere? Can that be wrapped into part of that value chain in agriculture that we are talking about? Third, even if you have storage, what types of standards are you going to use? And it can be something simple as not just your phytosanitary, but your packaging. Mm -hmm. When do we move away from plastics to some other biodegradable elements? And do we have the means to do that? Should we be waiting on an external power to tell us how to do this? Surely our universities mm -hmm. must be able to start advancing that and create, as it were, economic industries. At the same time, to meet the very, we started with food security, remember? <laughs> but food security has knocked back to renewable energy, has caught into education, has looked at impact of climate change, has talked about economic diversification and manufacturing advancements. Mm -hmm. It hasn't even reached your supermarket shelf. Mm -hmm. Supermarket shelf will determine or be determined by the mindset of our people. Are they willing, ready to let go of the natural preferences for overseas food to domestically grown food? And we know that's an issue, whether people prefer homegrown rice, for example, versus imported rice from Thailand. I mean, that's uh, something that's there. The mindset of our people will need to be able to change that we can all see this as part of that food security issue that we are talking about. Who controls that in terms of the firms? Large, small, MSMEs, small farmers, how do they get to choose? What's your overall governance structure? embedded within that one food security issue that needs to be brought together to get you there. And then, after you've grown it, since every country cannot grow it, do we have the ability, transportation-wise, to move 
remove that good before it gets perished or inappropriate uh, transportation facilities to the other countries that are not as blessed in terms of land space. Mm -hmm. Now, that tells you now transportation, logistics, or what I like to call connectivity, becomes an important ingredient as well as the climate and the education and the social psyche and mindset and governance and all of the regulatory elements all to handle the one thing food security which but which that is in my mind how we should be looking at development and here again um we're talking about the changing of the mindset changing of all mindset. having to do with yeah. people's tastes yeah. and yeah. um the power of advertising the power of lobbying yeah. um food security yeah. is the extension of food insecurity exactly and and yeah. therefore, um, I remember, and oh, I have written about it several times, um, a session that you addressed here um, with the then um, the chairman of the board of the Eastern Caribbean um, Development Bank, St. Lucia's um, Prime Minister and Finance Minister, who was not yet, had not yet assumed um, the chairmanship of the CDB. Mm -hmm. But between then and now, that has happened. But back then, a year ago, you were appealing to youth yeah. and young people to look at the need to revisit mm -hmm. um, the, 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 with innovations in mind. Um, some of the things yeah. we have taken sure. for granted, yeah. Yeah. the use of um, aloes yes. in yeah. health foods, mm -hmm. the use of um, Caribbean products mm -hmm. from coconuts yeah. to fruits yeah. in, yeah. Um, 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 in, you know, as an ingredient yeah. in elements. Yeah. And you were inviting yeah. the young people yeah. to begin to uh, be innovative in not just science and technology, yeah. Yeah. but to look at everything from yeah. the water we drink to the food sure. we eat sure. and the clothes we wear. Yeah. Um, for your 53rd AGM, there yeah. was another um, special um, session that brought together youth. Yes. Um, yeah. um, did you leave the AGM with a feeling, I know you said that your directors um, you feel they agreed um, with what you asked them to agree to. At least the paradigm. The paradigm, the, yeah. new, for the new paradigm yeah. shift. Yeah. Um, did you get a sense uh, from the meeting with young people that they are prepared uh, to uh, shift the emphasis from seeking an education overseas mm -hmm. to staying home and helping to build capacity, resilience, and all of that on the basis of the new paradigm of science and technology today, allowing them uh, to access information uh, much easier than anybody else on planet Earth has ever had before. Yeah, well, the, the Youth Fire Forum we had uh, was not specifically targeting that that question that you you raised but i think it is fair to say that there are as many young uh, and young for me is not cron age mm -hmm. young for me is less experienced in a particular area and so we've used the, the phrase not youth, but future leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, because future leaders can be 40 and 50 as well, mm -hmm. as long as they, they have the potential and are in a readiness state to assume leadership. And there may be some at 20 mm -hmm. that are ready to assume leadership. So it is for me more, how do we get those young future leaders ready? ready ready um, and that readiness involves partly this mental shift and the mental shift i think should not be an us against them we we should not be together, inward we should together. not be inward and say we will only stay home because going out doesn't allow us 
to contribute. And it should not be, we need to go out equally to get the experience to come in. Because that world uh, early is history. Um, we live in a, I think, uh, in my perspective, in a, in a global space that almost has no boundaries when it comes to knowledge acquisition, knowledge discovery, and knowledge transformation. And I, I use that to say that is the outcome of the digital world that we are in. There is no necessity as demonstrated by COVID. Why a St. Lucian in the diaspora living in New York cannot embrace the vision of a developing St. Lucia and contribute sitting in their home in New York to that development of St. Lucia. IT allows it. IT allows it. There is no reason why you cannot be sitting in St. Lucia developing an IT uh, device, an IT platform or software that can be used, sold, exported to somebody in Australia. So the boundaries that we had, one of space, two of distance to move things, and three of reach in terms of your capacity to reach and expand markets has almost disappeared. So we cannot even, again in my mind, hold on to the idea that we have limited market size. We don't. Mm -hmm. That market size is, is only market. limited by our minds. minds, our what I call our unbounded mm -hmm. imagination. Bounded says I'm already putting limits. Our unbounded imagination can take us to anywhere we want in the current environment. What I think we need to do is to recognize that that digital world of today, and without any shadow of doubt, the digital world of tomorrow, mm -hmm. can only be used to great effect if we embrace it and embrace it fully. And so from my vantage point, every government should now see the benefit of embracing and going full steam ahead on digital platforms. And not just digital platforms by way of backbones. I'm talking now the use of digital transformation in every, every aspect of our lives, down to the education system that should allow us to see that the use of digital, and let's just take it a little further, even AI, how do you embrace artificial intelligence? to allow you to move faster, quicker, more nimbler in the production of digital products that can, in principle, allow you to grow and get rid of the constraints of small size. Now, equally, small size as land mass should not be an impediment either. It's an impediment, it's an impediment if and only if you see production as being physical. But what if production is not physical and you embrace digital production, or let's call it digital services, then it doesn't matter how big we are because everything is stored essentially in the cloud. And if everything is stored in the cloud and the cloud is unlimited, and our imagination is equally unbounded, then what is the necessity of embracing we are small in land size? It doesn't matter. One individual can have the intellectual might and power of one million people. And if you embody that with the appropriate infrastructure, the, the sky essentially is the limit. And if you then say, let's harness all of that intellectual might of our people wherever they are in the world, 
and focus that on helping develop and grow that particular segment, there's no limit in my mind again of how far we can push the boundaries. But it calls for, you know, I keep making that point, uh, Earl, it calls for a change in the way we see ourselves, the way we, the paradigm of what is product, what is our advantage, and what we should be pivoting on in a world of tomorrow, not a world of today, in a world of tomorrow. But I want to I want to I want to come in on a, um, a, a troublesome issue yeah. that, that has been troubling me um, insofar as the globalization of uh, the digital age mm -hmm. and its application of digitization to education. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know whether. Um, we are going overboard in assuming uh, that digitization can be applied across the board beyond boundaries across territories and horizons. Um, from the standpoint uh, that um, it all has to do with, from my experience and our experience in St. Lucia, uh, the um, capacity of everybody to access digitization. Now, the two main service providers in St. Lucia carry out annual surveys. And one of the latest ones I read, and um, the, the figures remained in my mind, 18% and 20%. I might use them inter interchangeably, yeah. but um, we have, let's say, 20% sure. of, of, of persons yeah. who have access to broadband. Mm -hmm. But out of that 20% yeah. who have access to broadband, yeah. only 18% yeah. use it for sure. information yeah. and for the uses we're yeah. talking about. So in the delivery of your digitization um, approach, to what extent are you able to measure the effect of the response yeah. to that? Uh, yeah. I thought I should sure. throw that yeah, in yeah, because yeah. it worries me about it's, it's a fair where everybody said if you're not on Facebook, then no. you ain't nowhere. It's, it's a fair. It's a fair question. It's mm -hmm. a fair question. Um, but we need to we need to distinguish two sides of the of the story. Mm -hmm. The first is where do we need to be? Okay. Same question. It goes back to the question of knowing your North Star in development. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, without a shadow of doubt, if I can use 100%, I'll use it. Tomorrow's world, tomorrow's world will not be usable to all of our people if we are not embracing a digital space. That, that's the first point I want to make. Now, between where we are now and where we need to be, which is the passage of time, the development path and development trajectory, we may very well be at 20% penetration. Mm -hmm. But the mistake that we would make I don't want to say we are making. Mm -hmm. The mistake that we would make mm -hmm. is to assume that our capacity to become 100% compliant has to be left, has to be left to the whims of anything. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, a mistake. We should be turning it over on his head and say, as a development objective, if we are at 20%, and we shouldn't say if we know that, but our future is dependent on us being at 100%, then that urgency of now that we talked about at the beginning necessitates that we need to put in place the design, the effort, the funding to get ourselves ready. In other words, we need to make our capacity endogenous. We, we start with it in the reverse way. We say our capacity is fixed. Because it is fixed, namely we are at 18%, 20% penetration, mm -hmm. I don't see how we can adopt a digital transformation as a goal. 
But notice what, the, I, I repeat that again. Mm -hmm. Because our capacity is at 20%, I don't see how we can adopt digital transformation as a goal. Mm -hmm. That is the mistake I'm saying we should not be making. We should not make that. We should be saying, given our goal is because of, and because we are at 20%, we have no choice but to, but to implement mm -hmm. the capacity, whether it is in the establishment of broadband infrastructure, of changing our education system, to allow us on how to use this over the next 10 years so that kids who enter kindergarten by the time they leave secondary school into A-level college or CXE, they will in principle be fully conversant. Equally, that the workplace requirements 10 years down the road ought to be such that our curricula, our pedagogy should already have switched so that by the time we are there, we can be not at 20% penetration, but at 90% effectiveness, not even penetration, mm -hmm. effectiveness. effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the design of development policy. Mm -hmm. Now that is not your GDP policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not your GDP policy, because your GDP will be, how do I put your fiscal and your monetary to grow, because I want to measure GDP. So we need to broaden that space, but with an eye on the price. And, and abolish, abolish, if I can go that far, abolish the idea that our constraints limit our vision. We need to say, we need to say, Earl, that every constraint we can establish need to be now reverse engineered as an element of policy to change our capacity and therefore get us to that promised land that we are talking about. That's a fundamental shift in how we look at development. Certainly, and um, in terms of taking that at, um, at a regional level within the context of the changes that have been um, taking place, um, the effects of the changing um, geopolitical, economic, uh, global world order on uh, small island developing states and developing countries, um, like you've pointed out, is it's, it's more accelerated as time goes by. And therefore, um, the region, but also nations, have to respond accordingly. And um, earlier I was making the point about the way in which, unfortunately, nationalism can trump regionalism um, when push comes to shove yep. um, at the regional level. We yep. need not go into the historical um, factors that have, have indicated that. Yep. But certainly I um, feel that the current crop of political leaders in the region, um, most of whom today went to the same school, right. um, the University of the West Indies, have a greater level of, of a common denominator in understanding um, that we have to swim together or sink or drown yeah. um, together. So is it a situation where, for example, um, Guyana, in its new um, paradigm um, as a borrowing member country, um, you can easily find yourself in a situation as a bank with a member uh, country, a borrowing member country that is more fluid than the bank itself, but with a political directorate uh, that um, is closer to the bank's thinking than um, under the during the colonial period. Um, Guyana has, for example, yes, they're the 
the, the fourth um, the largest um, non-offshore oil economy, the set to soon become the richest country in South America. But as I often say to people, um, these are projections, like you were saying, where they will be. Let's look at where they are now, because there are people who still ask, why is Guyana still borrowing money? Um, so all this to come to the thing of carbon credits. Carbon credits is a new, a new approach that um, Guyana used uh, to attract um, funding uh, by uh, selling its carbon credits to investors in energy. Not every s small island can talk about selling its carbon credits, but if the region, as a region, decides to get together and add up um, whatever it is, adds up to the cost of car carbon credits, is that something yeah. that the bank would 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 see within the context of a, the new development paradigm yeah. um, in terms of a, a united approach to energy? So there, there are two two things. Maybe we can uh, touch on or your question suggests. And if I don't talk about two, remind me. The, the first I think is the principle again of partnerships. And partnerships this time interpreted as regional cooperation and integration. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, based, on, based on the very notion, the very idea that individually, individually, we can do well. But if we work collaboratively together, we can do better. And so the very push that we've been talking about on making regionalism, cooperation in the regional space alive is maybe the foundation of that very point that you were saying, is there room for the specific application of carbon credits? Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't even necessarily need to be um, at the level where each country may have the ability to have carbon credits. Mm -hmm. But what if we can develop knowledge, develop expertise that can be such that we could say for all countries in the region that wish to explore because they have the means, mm -hmm. explore the idea of carbon credits, they can have access to services provided by a common unit, let's say the bank or whoever else, uh, so that they would not be negotiating, not going into this new or without the relevant knowledge. Now that's sharing mm -hmm. of information services that can help promote the carbon credits. We talk a lot about the large ocean states, which is the only one thing that is common across all of our um, countries in the region. Mm -hmm. Why can't we explore and spend the time now looking at the R&D of using the ocean as a giant uh, carbon sink. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, then it would surely make a lot of sense to bundle not only resources, but the use of those uh, resources and technical knowledge and uh, know-how to be able to say how can all of us benefit in unison, in unison from say the deployment of this five, ten times the size, land mass of our countries, that's water that we can use. The Bahamas, as we know, is using seagrass because they have it. But is that the only use of marine space or ocean uh, um, elements that can be used as carbon. Uh, if we are not as, um, as uh, let's say, endowed as your Guyanas, mm -hmm. um, in terms of land mass mm -hmm. that have, or Suriname, that have dense um, forests that can act as carbon sinks. What about the small islands that don't have that mass, but maybe have oceans? Mm -hmm. Is there a way we can start thinking about that? But it boils down to one phrase, cooperation.
collaboration, collaboration, and seeing our joint destiny improving if we agree to act together. So, we so have, that, that's your sharing to grow mm -hmm. element that I want to I want to bring back on the table. But with one additional twist, and you touched on it mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned the, the various heads, at least going to the UWI. Mm -hmm. There's something that I think we need to think a little about, and it's linked to the whole uh, regional collaboration integration space. And that's the principle of sovereignty and independence. And you, you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. It says nationalism is typically uh, Trump's regionalism. Trump's regionalism. Mm -hmm. And the question in my mind is why? It is, it's quite clear you cannot have absolute nationalism in terms of pure sovereignty mm -hmm. and at the same time talk about sharing of the regional ecosystem and at the same time say you want the regional good mm -hmm. to be better than the individual parts, something has to give way mm -hmm. in the process. And that, I think, is maybe the conversation we should be having. What is the appropriate definition of sovereignty? Are we overly constraining ourselves by adopting definitions of sovereign states, which, if you recall what I talked about previously, would have made a lot of sense in terms of physical mass and boundaries. But when you don't have those boundaries anymore, should we be rethinking what sovereignty should mean? And by extension, regionalism becomes an extension of your own boundary to embrace and encompass the totality of the region. What does that sovereignty mean relative to the national sovereignty? How much do you give up in the betterment of the whole? But that presupposes you are putting value on the whole that is larger than the value you would have had if you were on your own. But that implies that the very principle of sovereignty, the very principle of independence, which carries individual responsibility and joint responsibility, needs now to embrace that, uh, what I can say, impossibility of squaring the, the circle of the three elements that we just talked about. And so, in the very issue of mindset change, development paradigm change, where does regionalism rise? Where does it rise? And when it rises to that level, the question then becomes, how much of the sovereignty that we know of, and we all accept, and every head should be proud of, ought to be, and I'll use a strong word, sacrificed mm -hmm. for the better good of the whole. But we can only we can only embrace that if we know the North Star, if the North Star of development outcomes is going to be better through the principle of the whole, the sharing to grow. Once we accept that, then it becomes quite clear logically, we need to work backwards. What's the design that will enable that North Star? So a large part of this for me, and we say, what do we mean by development, has to embrace that very fundamental line of what is sovereignty. And you know, we, we are there because, unfortunately, um, we have all embraced, and we should, the principle of independence. But what exactly is independence? Independence is, is it gaining sovereignty, control of your affairs. 
But that control of your affairs, that responsibility to deliver, has the silver lining of how does that delivery change if I have to be working together, collectively. Inter interdependency. Interdependency. But when we, each of us, I think, went down the independence and the sovereignty and the constructs of those that we inherited from the North, mm -hmm. have we, and I wouldn't say did, I know we did not, mm -hmm. today, have we stopped to think that those, uh, let's be blunt, imports mm -hmm. of structures that defy or define sovereignty and independence, are those fit for purpose of the necessity of regional constructs that are needed and maybe even essential for delivery of the North Star, the development outcomes? Mm -hmm. And, and that, that brings me to the issue as we uh, begin to get closer to um, summing up. Um, the a question that I've, I've always wanted to, to, to put forward, particularly um, in the um, post-Ukraine, uh, um, post-COVID, post-Ukraine um, situation, and that is, do we need in our development reconstruct and our revisiting of our education processes, are we at the stage now where we have to stop thinking north-south? Um, are we at the stage where we have to continue thinking first world and third world, yeah. um, the richer and the poorer? Yeah. Um, so Arthur wrote in the 60s about the agony of the eight. Yeah. Um, decades later, um, is it the same agony? Um, that is facing, affecting um, what used to be the eight, uh, which would be much more now if we look to add the non-independent territories that all fall within mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the definition of uh, Caribbean, which goes beyond CARICOM, sure. which goes beyond the individual regional entities, but for a wider purpose, let's say, all the countries washed by the Caribbean Sea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, um, do you think that our re-education um, needs to take into consideration what yeah. you said earlier yeah. about not letting size be yeah. a, small size be yeah. a limit? Yeah. Now, I, I, I definitely believe that is the case um, at two levels. The first is, if you think of how our education system is, it is not necessarily geared towards learning. I make a distinction. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily geared towards learning. And what we again inherited in terms of subject matter, um, subject matter learning skills are those the appropriate foundation for tomorrow's world and again I would argue you no know, while it's just like the GDP vulnerability story while we do need to continue the issue of subject matter assimilation. What I think will get us to the next variation of where we ought to be is developing skills of inquiry, skills of discovery, and skills of problem solving. Now, I, I use that to say, for me, that's the foundation that should be from kindergarten, not to CXC or university, but lifelong learning from literally cradle to the grave. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, if we take that as the foundation on which all of our learning 
is going to occur, and that will include not only the subject matter, the execution through things like your problem solving, but equally the adaptation from learning mm -hmm. mistakes mm -hmm. and successes to all the way through your life that you are a perpetual learner. That mindset now of education, which is very different from our, let's learn the subject matter, become an expert in one piece of something for a period of time, work, retire, as opposed to learning foundations of knowledge, foundations of knowledge, which can be applied in whichever field that we want, allows us to be almost nimble, adaptable. We can switch from one field to the next because the subject matter is not the beginning and end. It is only an application. All I need is to pivot, but I would have learned the fundamental foundations of inquiry, discovery, and problem solving. If we do that and change it and embrace the idea of lifelong learning, we can change that whole education system that we talk about. So that's one um, dimension. The second, I think, is the fact that we continue to believe in single monolingual modes of expression. Uh, it's equally clear, let's just take our hemisphere, it's equally clear that again in today's day and age where I do not need to travel to be in a different environment where another language is being spoken, there is nothing which says we should continue to be teaching in St. Lucia only English. One, and you've heard me say this, why don't we embrace quail? There's nothing preventing us from saying, at least in St. Lucia and among quail speaking countries in the region, that all of our kids from beginning to end, not replace English, but embrace learning Creole in a common vernacular, common syntax, common, um, let's say, writing style that everyone can read the particular line and now can communicate across the Creole speaking countries in Creole that automatically gives you an expansion of market because all it takes me is the ability to write in Facebook, mm -hmm. a message in Creole, mm -hmm. and something that I am working on now reaches the Creole speaking world instantaneously. Mm -hmm. I get around my narrow village uh, market by just simply being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Why then can't we extend that? Wouldn't we be better off if we had the entire region? And the region for me is starting, uh, let's say, Mexico, mm -hmm. all the way down to the northern parts of South America, you know, Colombia, mm -hmm. all the way, let's say, to Brazil. The northern shoulder. Northern shoulder. What if we said this became a multilingual hemisphere, sub-hemisphere? where every child that leaves school would be conversationally, not necessarily certified, conversationally fluent, fluent mm -hmm. in at least, let's say, four languages. Mm -hmm. English, leave Creole for now, that's mm -hmm. maybe smaller. English, French, Spanish, Dutch, maybe even Portuguese. Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Now, you could argue, well, what are the requirements of that? I would say not that much. No. Because Practice. you can have, again, with your digital connectivity, you can have a Spanish speaking, Dutch speaking, Portuguese speaking, master and teacher. And language programs. Uh, wherever programs wherever they are, but wherever they are, they can teach almost the entire region simultaneously at the same time, mm -hmm. and we are in the same time zone. Uh -huh. 
But if we take that a little further and say, okay, so now we can speak and we can all converse, just think of the potential for trade, for commerce, for employment, again in a digital space, mm -hmm. that opens up immediately. Because then I can write, I can market, I can advertise, I can sell my knowledge, my skills, and what I'm doing in any of the languages. But you can take it to the next level and say, okay, so now you're conversational. Those who want can potentially be certified, get a CXE um, type idea. But what then if you make it a simple line of saying universities in the region, as part of their graduating requirements, mm -hmm. must teach one course, a core course, capstone course in at least two languages. Mm -hmm. Now, I think UWE, last I heard, has now embraced that idea of two languages mm -hmm. or thereabouts. But supposing you made that a requirement, then every graduate of UWI automatically not only can converse day to day, but has the ability at the professional level in their field, communicate professionally in at least two, three languages. Now, it may take 10, 15 years to get there if we start now. But you have to start. If we start now, but think of the Caribbean in 15 years' time. Every child who entered school, kindergarten, can speak three languages, not even five, three. Every bachelor's that would have come out at, by that time can speak economics, marketing, politics, international relations, whatever, science, chemistry, in three languages. Sufficient to now say, my market, my domain is not my 180,000 people in St. Lucia, but 15, and if you add the broader Latin American space, 400 mm -hmm. odd million people. Now just think of the transformation of a simple idea. Let's introduce it at school, conversational. Doesn't add much because I invest in my broadband and every country has blanket broadband, full stop. I can get a native speaker, teacher in any of those countries to teach all of my children natively. Doesn't add much. Okay, yes, you'll need some support in terms of one or two people helping, but our AI systems can already, once you deploy them, help you with intonation, pronunciation, cross-check what you're doing, give you feedback, and get you to where you need to be without having a physical body. Okay, but you need the North Star. Mm -hmm. And you need a starting point. And you need now. a starting point now, not <laughs> tomorrow, now. No. That's the urgency of now that we are talking about. And some of the things we can do today. Mm -hmm. Not waiting until you get the help and the pledges mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. were talking about. Starting with what Start we have. Starting with what you have and what you can do. Now. Now. Mm -hmm. My pen now. penultimate question before that, I'd um, share with you that um, in my uh, more recent discussions with fellow advocates um, for change, Caribbean change, whenever the issue of access to beaches uh, comes up, um, which comes up every year, everywhere. Um, I often say that um, I would rather our objective, rather than access to beaches in front of hotels, that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. that I would rather know that we adopt a policy at the regional level uh, that um, after 15 years, we want to know that every single Caribbean uh, person who's born can swim. 
that, that's, that's a great point. You just can't <laughs> swim. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. <laughs> you know, then you can talk about where you want to swim, whether sure. it's in front of sure. a hotel. Because sure. I'm not sure everybody sure. wants to just sure. go to swim in front of a hotel. Sure. But don't tell us we cannot. Sure. Sure. And um, sure. it is in that context I want to go into another issue that is very close to, 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 to me and to the region. And that but, is. But before you go there, though, yeah. how, how do you quickly put this in place that every child or adult for that matter every citizen mm -hmm. should, um, learn, should learn to swim yeah it, 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 because um, uh, agrees not um, only is it a, a safety issue mm -hmm. and a potential saving of lives mm -hmm. and so on uh, but that I don't think is a very big thing to do. But no. Why? Why can't we agree to adopt that? Yeah, because um, uh, most most mothers, particularly first-time mothers in the Caribbean, would balk at you telling them to drop the child in a in, in a pool of water, but they'd be surprised to see the child trying to swim. swim. Yeah, almost <laughs> instinctively. <laughs> almost instinctively, yeah. it's yeah. like yeah. putting a, a, a telephone, sure. a cell phone, before a, a, a one-year-old six month old baby, they immediately push their fingers ahead with a smile. Or the little kid you see now, two years old, that knows how to tap an iPhone or an iPad without any knowledge or any education. They, they kind of have that instinct. Yes, um, uh, yeah. my, my, my granddaughter never forgets to remind me that um, I have to make the transition to um, the digitized age. But then <laughs> I said, since you have the microchips in your blood, <laughs> I rather, I rather you know, take it from you all the time. Yeah. But the issue I want to go to quickly yeah. is um, the issue of reparations, which um, CARICOM governments um, agreed on in 2013, mm -hmm. and um, in the 10 years since then, the issue has globalized. This is another issue that CARICOM raised and which has um, outgrown the region from the standpoint it is globalized across continents, Europe, Africa, America, the Americas and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And what we have is in that 10 year period, the biggest problem we've had is to assess how much we're owed. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the 10 year period, um, a study group has come up with a figure of um, over $100 trillion owed to the Caribbean, the Americas, uh, the Caribbean and the Americas. Um, in 1939, Sir Arthur Lewis um, wrote uh, his first seminal work called Labor in the West Indies, which has been adopted by CARICOM in 2020 as the blue for what I like to call the um, the economic aspect of uh, of reparations, um, from the historical standpoint of um, Sir Arthur's document blueprint template being adopted uh, by CARICOM since 2020 mm -hmm. and three years later we now have a figure by an international um, an international body and with King Charles uh, saying he's willing to um, um, research the role of the royal family the king of the Netherlands uh, saying the same Belgium they're all saying let's talk reparations let's talk money even though we haven't apologized or agreed on any sum. Should reparations become, be achieved, there will be an economic aspect. Is the bank involved in any way in um, preparing or has it been called upon to um, offer suggestions as to how to approach this issue? Because apart from the political aspect of reparations, yeah. there is the most important, the economic aspect, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which would require, as CARICOM has agreed, that the money don't go to governments or to the pockets of individuals who can prove um, their, their birthright to Africa, but uh, that, that money
money uh, should go to the region. Yep. And once is the Caribbean Development Bank naturally placed uh, to be a part of that mechanism. Uh, so um, if you have, uh, could you tell us what the thinking is if you haven't, um, the CDB being a proactive entity, are you thinking of that possible yeah. um, reality down the road? Yeah. Uh, no, we, we are not part of that uh, broader conversation that you you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I guess partly it's been in the political stroke, um, academic advocacy space, um, and even measurement space, trying to put a figure to it. Uh, but at the same time, I would think we are in the space. And I'll, let me draw the parallel for you. We are not calling it reparations. Um, but if you think through it well, it aligns exactly to the thought leadership ideas we have been expounding. Let me help you. Mm -hmm. The need for a North Star. What exactly is development? Mm -hmm. The need to connect where you were with where you are today and where what you're you heading to do to get there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the broader framework. Mm -hmm. now, if you think of reparations in the way, at least I understand it, there's the issue of, let's go back to Serafa, the 200 years of I think that's the Unpaid numbers. Labor. That's the numbers that um, <laughs> I remember a conversation yeah. <laughs> with um, with Sir Henry uh -huh. some time ago. Uh -huh. 200 years. Sir Henry Beckers. Yes, 200 years of labor that was either unpaid or inadequately mm -hmm. paid. Um, if you put a number of slaves across the space, let's say, I don't know how many, you know that number better than me, 20, 15, 15. million. Mm -hmm. That 200 years over 15 million is one way of value. And we can make the argument that that value that was denied accrued to the colonial masters at the time and therefore buttressed their opportunity, their wealth, etc. And so you can think of this as a pure economic value. But I think the bigger issue, which is maybe where I think Sir Arthur's mind was, because he did say, if I recall correctly, we know the colonial masters will not uh, pay that money. I mean, that was his, um, his text. Mm -hmm. And in fact, now that I'm recalling it, he made exactly the point I am making now. Let's, we know they're not going to pay, so let's do what we can do. Mm -hmm. Same clarion call today, I don't know, almost 100 years after. But the, the bigger point was that because of that lost opportunity, because of the non-payment, as it were, of value of services provided, the opportunity for growth, the empowerment that ought to have occurred did not occur. And therefore, where you are today is much less than why you would have been if that had actually occurred. And so we can argue now, separate from the value proposition, what are the alternatives that could be had to redress that balance? And as you equally know, Earl, whether it is the issue of educational incentives mm -hmm. or reforms that are being proposed um, to help change the landscape in application so that the goal of development, however we define that, will be better able to be achieved 
that's another area. And so I think of it as, yes, there's a money issue, which is always going to be, I think, a hot topic of debate. But what else in that space that is non-monetary that can help change the today factor mm -hmm. and change the trajectory of tomorrow that will get us to that development space of interest. And so if you just simply remap that, this is exactly everything I've been talking about, mm -hmm. except I'm not using the word reparations. Mm -hmm. And I'm not using the context of slavery, but the truth is where we are today, as I said at the beginning, is a, consequence of, is a consequence of where we were and what we didn't do or what we didn't have the opportunity to do. But today, and hence why we cannot necessarily wait on pledges, mm -hmm. those pledges are like the reparations money mm -hmm. that we are all asking for. It might come, might not come. It might come in part or in whole. But should or we, not at all. Or not at all. <laughs> should we be waiting mm -hmm. until all of that happens to get us to our North Star? Mm -hmm. And my answer is probably no. No. Should we continue to push? The answer is obviously yes. Mm -hmm. How do we move along that pathway is where I think we need the strength to be able to sell the argument that while we all agree there was injustice, while we all agree we deserve better, while we all agree we need to end up in a different space, mm -hmm. should time be frozen? Should time be frozen while we allow all of that to happen? And I would want to argue no. we cannot. We cannot. And so when I say the bank is in the space, we are in the space in reframing the development dialogue. Mm -hmm. But are we in the space of the specific space of talking exact reparations money-wise? No. Are we in the space of things like incentives, reforms, that can help us get to there? The answer is yes, even if we are not calling it that. Uh, Mr. President, um, my ultimate um, question you answered very early, and it was about whether you had any um, confidence after your 53rd AGM, mm -hmm. and um, since then uh, the question was, do you have confidence that your directors and their political directors are on board? And um, you have indicated that from what you heard, they um, not only are ready to agree that there's a need for a new paradigm, uh, but uh, that uh, they also recognize the urgency sure. of now. Yeah. Uh, my final um, is not a question, but a request. And that is that in the same way like you, uh, in our first interview two years ago and in your uh, 53rd AGM, um, you did use uh, another language. <laughs> Um, that is uh, widely spoken. If we add Haiti, it is yeah. the uh, most widely spoken language within CARICOM, if we add Haiti yeah. as a member of CARICOM. But certainly beyond St. Lucia, Dominica, and um, Haiti, you have Tobago, and so many other wider Caribbean territories where Creole is also yeah. spoken, yeah. including St. Martin and um, the so-called uh, French overseas. Um, territories where you have lots of, of, of English-speaking yeah. Caribbean people as well. Alo esu sadino mani ausa tu sao jadino anque ora mi si presida. Merci, merci. Avant de aller là, moi je voulais prendre deux minutes pour dire une autre chose qui moi pas oublier mais nous pas tenir um, l'occasion pour pour dire ça alors moi quand il est en anglais et vire oui. uh, un peu oui. uh, so the the question i wanted to come back to which you touched on in the last question mm -hmm. is uh, your last opening remark is to do with 
the business of development. Mm -hmm. We have, and it's part of the paradigm shift, mm -hmm. we have for too long assumed that governments should drive development. I, I don't believe that is uh, correct. And I, I say that to say not that governments should not be driving, mm -hmm. but governments only on their own should not be the sole driving force mm -hmm. of development. And I want to link that to the point we made at the beginning, which is establishing what that NOFSTA is. Once you've established that NOFSTA, then what should be the driving motive force for development is partnerships between public, private, and if you want, um, civil society. Mm -hmm. Because it is about joint responsibility, sharing opportunities, sharing burdens, sharing the costs and sacrifices to get you to that North Star. And so if we stick with the mindset that only governments need to drive and only governments can provide, and we, meaning the non-governments, mm -hmm. don't have that responsibility to do, then our mindset will still be stuck in not getting to the, mind, to the North Star. And so we equally at the bank have been pushing for that partnership story between public and private, joining hands from conception to implementation, execution, and monitoring. In everything we do, not just what I'm using residual financiers, mm -hmm. to say, well, that is what the government is doing, and you now should do the rest, and call it you are now driving development from the private sector. That's uh, a very different idea. So I think we need to switch that mindset as well. So from the standpoint yeah. that um, um, the good ship Caribbean yeah. doesn't only need a captain, but an entire crew. An entire crew, exactly. Uh, without that, we will still stumble. We'll st um, and now to go to your, your last question. Oui, <laughs> well, pour dire, pour dire la vérité, le um, Premier ministre dit que je vais aller virer l'école créole parce qu'il n'y a pas de quoi je parler bien assez créole. À chaque monde, il était jaloux. <laughs> Mais um, peut-être des, des mots moi, que je voulais dire à uh, tout le monde. Um, travail, travail, développement. Ce n'est pas un travail qui sent, euh, ce n'est pas un travail non plus pour les gens qui ont faiblesse. Parce qu'ils sont toujours ni pour faire des décisions. Euh, les, tout le monde n'est pas content, tout le monde n'est pas une satisfaction. Et ça au cas dit, et ça au fait. Malheureusement, le euh, gouvernement ni besoin, moun, ni satisfaction en tout ça au cas fait chaque cinq ans, parce que si pas ça, il n'y a pas qu'à retourner au gouvernement. Mais où brisent gens qui ni forte, gens qui ni vision pour décider qui ça, qui y a besoin. Pas pour 5 ans, mais pour 30 ans, 50 ans. Et puis faire des décisions qui, qui fait ça qui est nécessaire pour n'importe quel pays, pour mener tout le monde ensemble, pour arriver côté qui la geste PIA, c'est plus meilleur facilité avant. Alors pour ça, le travail, vous avez besoin de tout le monde. 
gouvernement, les gens qui ont fait euh, machines, mm -hmm. euh, les autres qui ont travaillé, tout le monde ni pour ni on sait l'idée, on sait la euh, manière pour euh, garder la manière de pays à aller. Et au besoin pour ça parler, même euh, faire mon connaître qui ça a fait, les ou fait euh, les qui manière ou a changé pour retourner côté où tu allé avant. Mm -hmm. Alors, qu'a fait ça ou qu'a fait mon ni pas l'entier tout seul, mais commencer qu'à connaître et puis ni l'espoir qui ou ni l'entier tout le monde ensemble. Mm -hmm. Deuxièmement, pays seulement pas qu'à mener nous là. On est pour ni tout pays qu'à travailler ensemble. Alors c'est pour ça que nous avons dit que ce n'est pas seulement Sainte-Lucie, ou même Cévesant, ou Babad, mais tout le pays ensemble qui a travaillé pour qui manière, si ils ont tout fait, ça ils ont pour faire, ensemble, 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 euh, où est-ce nous, comment dire ça, élevé, oui. ensemble, et tout le monde qui a eu le développement, qui a avancé au même temps. Alors, c'est ça peut-être moi qui dis à tout le monde, nous, nous savons nous arriver en meilleure place, en temps, mais ça va marcher seulement si nous commençons à calculer différemment, de manière de nous s'y poser, travailler ensemble pour arriver à Chimea qui nous a dit nous voulons aller en, en long temps qui a fini. Uh, Mr. President of the, the Caribbean Development Bank, it has been another uh, pleasure uh, conversing with you and not necessarily interviewing. Um, I think we have established that um, we are at common points of understanding, um, even though at obviously different levels. Yeah. Um, but certainly one would hope uh, that uh, viewers today, tomorrow, and thereafter uh, will, from this exchange, have a better understanding of uh, the current new challenging uh, situation facing uh, the region. But as I always say, um, challenges always bring new opportunities. And everything uh, uh, President Leon has said uh, in this exchange um, shows clearly uh, that uh, he not only is offering prescriptions for change, but also offering uh, the encouragement uh, to understand uh, that these prescriptions are uh, not things, prescriptions that we have choices over, but prescriptions that we have to um, take from the standpoint uh, that we are in a region where we have learned by experience that uh, medicine never tastes sweet. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the interview with uh, CDB President Mr. Hygienus uh, Leon from uh, the Government Information Service, NTN, in Castries, St. Lucia, to the Caribbean and the world.